a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much. And um, um, I have a confession to make. It's been a long flight and I've been working through the flight, writing this paper. <laughs> so please wake me up if I fall asleep you know, halfway through this. <clears throat> so, um, you know, the thing was that last two years you've been, you know, hearing about it, you read the book, you seen the movie, you know, you've been sick and tired of listening to me doing my SDR. So I thought, you know, I'd take a break from that and um, dip back into some analog, de analog design. And um, actually, where are my glasses? So, um, you know, the, because I was, I was writing this paper on, you know, doing my flight, you, you wouldn't see it there. Uh, but Dave, if you could suggest how we could get it across to them, then, you know, we can even announce that, you know, my paper here. Yes, this paper's there. Yeah, I mean, it's here, but all right. In which case, I'll host it on my website, vu2esc.com, um, in a day or two. So <clears throat> this is what uh, the rig is about. Um, first, it's called uh, the Daylight Radio. Um, for no obvious reason, but except that I'd been humming this Cosby Stills and Nash song called Daylight Again uh, while coming here, but it was mostly because, you know, it's been two years and you're sort of getting back to where we were. So uh, it's a high performance radio. It's very simple, but um, the whole idea was to uh, get back to being, you know, doing analog design after almost a break of 15, 20 years. Um, and make it really, you know, push the envelope, not by using very expensive parts or, you know, doing weird stuff, but just making a normal radio and using a little bit of math to get the performance right. So it's got 90 dB dynamic range, not 100 dB, okay? But 90 dB is really good. It's really good uh, dynamic range. And I'll explain to you why it's good enough. But the more important thing here is 80 dB of close-in dynamic range. And what, I, what we mean by that is a lot of our operations are now not spread you know, across the band, but is very narrow. I mean, you know, the QRP gang is always at 7040. The entire FT8 is three kilohertz of 7075, I mean, 7074, et cetera. So what happens is that all these signals do not stop at the crystal filter, but they get through all the way to your ear. So you need to have everything from the audio amplifier onwards, which can handle so many signals together. Otherwise, you know, the 30 CW signals coming in through on a pileup uh, and your dynamic range of your audio is not good. If you're using an LM386, there's no way you'll be able to differentiate them all. Okay, but you know, we are in 2022 so we need to do something new. So one of the stuff that I've done is uh, 3D printed toroids. Okay, so toroids for free. I have a couple of them here, but you know, it's very easy to do that. And you know, all you need to do is, I can about print 15 of these in 10 minutes on a 3D printer. If you have a friend of yours, the STL file will be available. You can print them out, very high quality uh, toroids. Uh, then we do not have slow motion drives anymore, right? Um, hopefully we'll, I'll pick some up now. So uh, it's a permeability tunable oscillator, uh, meaning it's just a screw which goes in and out. Um, you know, that's a thing here. I'll actually pass one on either sides. So all you do is put the screw in and there are two nuts which are held together by the 3D form. And yeah, we will also discuss that separately. Um, the rest is all junk box parts. It costs less than $20 to build, very simple. Um, we've done SSB and not CW because simply because SSB is, a, is something of a more of a challenge than CW is. And if you can do an S SSB rig, it's very easy to convert that back to CW rather, rather than the other way around. So that's the one. And we are undoing a lot of lore here. So this entire thing about everything should be 50 ohms, everything should be diode mixers, et cetera, et cetera. So let's see what happens if we challenge these notions that we have grown up with, especially post 
EMRFD, the book. Um, sorry. So um, the rig is here. Okay, I'll even pass the rig along. Um, so this is um, a front end. Okay, and um, in this front end, let me just see if I can set my notes here. Okay. <clears throat> So this is called a cascode mixer, okay? Um, earlier, they were, these were made using MOSFETs. You must have seen a lot of dog demos uh, radios which use this in the front end. But, you know, after a while they said, no, the di diode mixers are much better and you, we started using them. But there's a lot to be said about this, okay? First, it's got plus eight dBm IIP3, meaning the, I mean, it takes an eight, DBM, which is about five milliwatt of signal to completely overload it. Okay, where it just starts clipping entirely. Um, and it's got 10 dB gain, which means essentially the output distortion level, uh, you know, intercept point is plus 18 dBm. And it does all this with just three milliamps of current. Okay, it needs very little VFO power because you see the, the, the VFO here is being injected into the gate. And this doesn't, you know, take any power at all. It's a very high impedance input. Um, there's no post mix amplifier required. So you don't have to have a high current post mix amplifier there with its toroids, et cetera. <clears throat> it's 4 dB noise figure, which means actually you can use this in a VHF setting. Um, and you know, the input and output impedances could be whatever you want them to be. So you see the resistor on the gate of Q2 uh, and the resistor at the drain of the upper transistor, you just pick whatever you know, impedance you want it to terminate with, and that's it. You know, it's, it's pretty simple to use. Most importantly, you do not have to wind a bifiller transformer here or a trifiller transformer. So it's really simple. You know, just use a toroid, put in about 10, 15 turns, and you're done. It's an excellent mixer. Uh, we haven't been using this for a long time. <clears throat> so uh, I investigated this for a while, a couple of, you know, probably about a year ago, and it turned out to be a really a wonderful way of getting this thing going. So, um, uh, next slide please. I'll just explain this, uh, the concept of the distortion here. So when we say that it's an eight dBm um, mixer, what we mean is that if you are driving this with an eight dBm signal, which is a five milliwatt signal, your distortion will also be up here. Your, your signal will be as high, as low or as high as the distortion. Both of them will be on the same level. Now, as you keep backing off the signal from the 8 dBm level, for each dB that your signal comes down, your distortion will keep coming down by 3 dB. So the distortion keeps coming down three times as much as the signal comes down. So at some point, the distortion will fall into the background noise and you will not see the distortion at all, right? So what's that point? This point where the signal is just so strong that the distortion comes onto the ground, you know, onto the noise floor, that's your dynamic range, which means that all signals below that level will not produce any distortion. As a result, you will not see splatter, you will not see birdies, spurs, etc. So uh, if you take minus 107 dBm as your noise floor, which is one microvolt. And the noise floor here, by the way, is not the noise floor of your radio. Your radio is really too sensitive. It's the atmospheric noise which will dominate this. So we're talking about, you know, if it was 70, if your noise floor was one microvolt, you would get about 77 dB of headroom before you'd start seeing distortions, right? So, <clears throat> Now, the other thing is that we usually do make radios, right? And uh, you see something in the, in the circuit diagram in the book, and then you make it and you see that it's really wonderful or not. Sometimes the simplest of radios become really, really clean sounding radios. And some, at times you make something really complicated and intense, but after months of work, you switch it on and it's horribly sounding. So you always remember with nostalgia that, you know, I had a radio, which worked very well. On the other hand, there was another one which overloaded, et cetera, et cetera. So what's behind this? Okay, uh, next slide, please. So uh, you see a radio like this. I mean, I tried making this, it even worked. 
Okay, this is the NR60. It was a favorite among Indian builders. If you actually see this, you know, <laughs> just as a matter of curiosity, this is a mixer. It's a substitute for the CA3028 for people who've lived through those times. So there are four of them surrounding the filter. So, you know, anyway, um, it was really horrible. Uh, we do not know how we managed to make contacts with them, but uh, yeah, confusion will be my epitaph. Uh, nobody knew how it worked, what worked where, etc. So the idea was that, you know, you take each block and build this radio block by block. And you know that each block is working well. You know what the IIP3 is, what the noise figure is, what the gain is, the three important things. But when you string them together, there's something which is happening, which is making a radio good or bad. So what exactly is this? Uh, fortunately for us, uh, Wes made a tool called cascade.exe. I don't know how many people have heard of this tool. It came with the EMRFD. Uh, CD. Very few people, I would guess. Any hand? Yeah, all, all right. That's just one person. So I'll explain this tool. It's very important to, you know, understand what this tool does because, you know, you get these, the stuff in a lot of magazines and books where you see a radio and you assemble it. That's fine. You also know how to make a diode mixer. You know how to make an amplifier. You know how to make filters. Yet you're not making the whole radios. And the reason is you don't know how to combine them together and what happens there. So next slide, please. Okay, so this is the tool which he wrote in 70s uh, on, under DOS, then he made it into a Windows version. Then they it turns out that there was problem, security problem with that EMRFD CD. So they stopped distributing this tool. There is no substitute for this tool now. So I made a web version of this, which is available on my view to ese.com. So what this does is this. Now, if you see here, what we are doing is that we are putting a number of blocks, bandpass filter, mixer, post mixer amplifier, filter, the IF amplifier detector, and the audio frequency amplifier, gain for each one of them. Uh, I think I'm getting a feedback there. Uh, so gain, noise figure, and the output intercept figures for each one of these stages. Then when you press the button, it gives you the complete performance of the entire RF chain. It could do it for the receiver or the transmitter, okay? Now, <clears throat> I highly recommend, please just go back to that one. Yeah, sorry. <clears throat> to, you know, keep playing with this. For instance, you will understand that if you change the bandwidth from 2,500 hertz to 500 hertz, your dynamic range would go up, right, or down, etc. cetera. Uh, but I mean, this, is, I mean, if you have the older CDs, you will see this on the CD. If you don't have that, don't worry at all. I have got this thing exactly done uh, as a JavaScript on my website. So let's look at that. Next slide, please. Yeah, um, it's a little grayish, but if you guys can make out, it's still the same thing. Bandpass filter, mixer, post mixer amplifier, crystal filter, IF amplifier detector, and audio amplifier. Now. Uh, here, I'll just explain a couple of things to you that in the bandpass filter, the gain is negative because there is a loss in the filter, right? So there's a loss in that filter. A mixer, it's a diode mixer, again, minus 7 dB loss. Then the post mix amplifier has a 16 dB gain right here. Can I have a pointer, please? Yeah. Sorry. Okay. Button at the top. Okay, yeah. All right. So, um, all right, I'll be a little fair to the people on the left. So, oops, what's that? Okay. Oh, I was gonna try to highlight and see if there was a pop-up or anything. Okay. Mm. Okay, so uh, that's a bandpass filter with minus three dB loss, mixer with minus seven dB loss, then post mixer with 16 dB gain, crystal filter with minus three dB loss, IF amplifier with 6 dB gain, then detector with minus seven and audio amplifier with 40 dB gain, right? Now the noise figures <coughs> are also entered here. Uh, what you have to remember is that for passive stuff like a mixer, diode mixer or a bandpass filter or a crystal filter, we do not have gain. Your noise figure is same as your loss. So if you have seven dB loss in your uh, diode mixer, you put that in as a noise figure here as well, right? And then you put the 
output and intercept figures. These are the output intercept figures. These are pretty standard, except for that the IF amplifiers, I put it as plus 3 dB, uh, plus 30 dB, which comes from a 2N3904 bias at 20 milliamps of current, which is, you know, pretty normal. I mean, that's, for example, what would be there in a bit X20. And then you press the evaluate button and you get a two-tone dynamic range of just 67 dB. This is a standard, uh, you know, uh, super head. And this is because we are looking at the dynamic range all the way to the audio amplifier. Here. Okay, all the way to the audio amplifier. Here. But if you, um, you know, make these stages, that is stages after the crystal filter, uh, as with OIP three of 200 each, which essentially means you don't bother about it. This, you're looking at signals which are outside the crystal filter, then the dynamic range will of course go up because you're not overloading the stages after the crystal filter, right? Then you would have your 90 dB dynamic range, but the in-channel dynamic range here is much lower. Next slide, please. So now here is the much simpler block diagram of the daylight transceiver where there's a bandpass filter followed directly by the cascode mixer that we spoke about, okay? Followed by the crystal filter then the detector and then the audio amplifier, right? So it's a much simplified version of the same blocks. And I've put in all the performance figures there. That's the gain of this mixer is being taken only as 8 dB because the, you know, uh, the, the matching is not very optimal in this radio. Crystal filter minus 3 dB loss, then the detector gets another 8 dB gain. Audio amplifier has got 40 dB gain. Uh, but if you look at the intercept figures, the intercept figure of the mixer OIP3 is now 18 because it's input intercept of 10 plus the gain of 8. So that's how you get the 18 figure there. Uh, <clears throat> and what you will see here is that your dynamic range now is up to, oh, sorry, what's happened? No, no. Can I just go back to that again, please? Okay, yeah, sorry. So um, I tried actually to get the, yeah. So the dynamic range here is 95 dB, which is pretty good. Uh, and this is for uh, signals which are being stopped by the crystal filter here. So after crystal filter, you will see that everything else is 200 dB, 200 dB here. This is all 200 dB because after the crystal filter, we expect that the signal does not propagate here. So this is for, signals which are outside the crystal filters bandwidth, which are about five, probably five or 10 kilohertz away, you'd get about 95 dB dynamic range on the simple radio. Uh, next slide, please. What should I do it from here? Okay. So um, we'll start with how to build the um, filters for this. This is a five megahertz filter. And this is the critical thing that for this radio, if choosing an IF frequency is very important, and um, I chose a five megahertz IF frequency. This has a lot of advantages. First advantage is that my local oscillator now is just two megahertz, right? Because five megahertz plus two will give me seven. The good thing about having a two megahertz VFO is it's going to be dead stable. It's going to be really stable. In fact, this is so stable, I can actually decode FT8 regularly. Okay, 15 minutes of warm up, and I can do that. Uh, the other advantage is that uh, what happens is that the narrowest frequency that you can, uh, the narrowest bandwidth that you can look at while designing a crystal filter will critically depend on the frequency of the crystal itself. That is, if you're able to, let's say, do a 100 hertz filter at 5 megahertz, a 10 megahertz crystal will be able to do only a 200, megahertz, a 200 hertz filter. And a 15 megahertz crystal will be able to do 300 hertz. So basically, the ratio of bandwidth to the central frequency of the crystal remains about the same. So at 5 megahertz, it's easy to make CW as well as SSB filters. At an IF of 11 megahertz, like the ones used in Microbitex, it's easy to make SSB filters, but far more difficult to make a good CW filter because the losses really mount up. <clears throat> okay, so this filter is called a QER filter. 
it's very easy to make the important thing there's just just two things to remember here all the capacitors are of exactly the same value okay uh, the end kept the 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 end quartz filled uh, crystals are doubled up the two of them paralleled up now the coupling capacitors will determine the bandwidth of the filter but there is going to be ripple inside it you control the ripple by actually controlling these two terminating resistors okay so this you i can actually put a 2k pot on both sides try wearing it scan it with your nano vna or your antuino whatever you have to get the bandwidth right and if you think it's too narrow then decrease the capacitance if you think it's too wide just increase the capacitance all capacitors are the same that's the beauty of it you don't have to do any maths bandwidth is controlled by capacitance the ripple is controlled by the resistors now you would ask okay if the ripple is controlled by the resistors why don't i just use the lowest uh, resistance and be done with it <coughs> now the problem with that is as the ripple goes away from the central from inside the crystal filters bandwidth the skirt from being vertical starts coming up so as the ripple goes down the skirt broadens right so you want you want less ripple so it's it's a trade off you want less ripple and then you get a you know a brick filter so that's that's what the trade off there is so at 5 megahertz the beauty the beauty about 5 megahertz is that the impedances that you are achievable are 1k on both sides okay 1k impedance now <clears throat> i'll just take a small diversion here which is that a lot of hams on our forum and even otherwise keep asking how do i measure the impedance of my crystal filter there is no impedance for a filter okay a filter will will exhibit different and very weird pass bands at every impedance so you choose an impedance depending on the pass band you want that filter to exhibit right so here when we say characteristic impedance we are saying the characteristic impedance that's required to drive and load a crystal filter with to get the bandwidth that you want so it you know i mean it's a there is no characteristic impedance for a filter regardless of the bandwidth or regardless of the shape so you want this shape you want this skirt you want this you know a central frequency then that's the impedance that you have to drive it with and that's the impedance that you have to terminate it with okay next slide please so this is what i got this is a sweep on the antuino and uh, this is about exactly 2.2 kilohertz wide and you'll see that the that the uh, at the center of it it's still showing minus 42 dbm as the as the pass band loss this is very high but this is high because i have put two resistors on both sides you remember where we were you know fiddling with it to get the uh, bandwidth right <coughs> but otherwise it, it's fairly good on the skirt on either of the sides 1 kilohertz away from the carrier your uh, carrier suppression is almost 40 db so there's another thing that you know we need to be aware of when we're talking especially on the transmitters that you think that Uh, for ssb um, i'll get a 50 db you know opposite sideband suppression or 60 db the fact is that your imd coming from transmitters is hardly about 25 db below the signal itself so <clears throat> the opposite sideband suppression beyond 25 to 30 db does not make any difference on ssb at all okay uh, because your splatter is going to be worse than your carrier and your opposite sideband okay next slide please <clears throat> so uh, having done the crystal filter the second thing is about the band pass filter itself and there is a little bit of maths here but just stay with me it's not too difficult at all so we talk about you know toroids or you say that i'm going to make an air core coil which is going to have very high and very good q right which is supposed to be the quality factor and we imagine that quality okay thanks to you know having red persig Uh, and zen on the out of motor bike maintenance is not an objective quantity but a subjective uh, you know uh, whatever thing to talk about so <clears throat> it's that's not true when we talk about 
quality factor of an inductor or a resonator, it means something very specific. It means the ratio of the bandwidth to the frequency. So if you say that at 10 megahertz, my bandwidth of, the, of your filter is one megahertz, it means your quality factor is 10 to one. So we want something which has 500 kilohertz at seven megahertz. So your loaded Q here should be 14, right? It's pretty simple maths. 7,000 divided by 500, 14. Okay, now <clears throat> what happens is that the quality of a resonator also depends on the losses inside the, reson inside the res resonating circuit, which can also be represented by a resistor in parallel to that, as you can see in the se second line, right? So another way to also express quality is by looking at it as if there's a resistor or rather a characteristic impedance of that coil in capacitor. And that's actually pretty easy to uh, calculate. It is the reactance of that coil of that inductor into the QL, which is the loaded factor. So here at 500 uh, kilohertz bandwidth, we got the, the Q factor as, uh, or the loaded Q as 14. And, the, and accordingly, the, the, the resistor which will, or the impedance which will exhibit that loss is coming to 1200. So that is what the characteristic impedance of your bandpass filter ought to be. Okay, that's pretty simple. So once you know that, um, and, and you know, you are choosing an inductor value here. For example, we started with a two micro Henry inductor, and then we calculated its uh, reactance at seven megahertz as 87 ohms. Then we multiplied it by 14, we got 1200. <clears throat> then you will need multiple of these uh, inductor capacitor tank coils which are resonating, which have to be coupled to each other, right? So the coupling capacitance is, you know, very easily uh, calculated as, don't ask me why, 0.7 into the resonating capacitance value divided by QL. All right, just remember that it's, there's a lot of maths behind it. The 0.7 can be something else. So depending on whether you want a Buttersworth response or a Chebyshev response, et cetera, uh, I mean, you know, there, there are different uh, coefficients which you can use, uh, but a rule of thumb is just use 0.7. So 0.7 into 250 PF divided by 14 comes to 12 PF. So that is the coupling between each of these, uh, you know, coil and capacitors. There's one little detail here, which is this, that once, for example, here, now there is a 12 PF, coupling capacitor on either sides, and this was, was 250 PF. But now with this 250 PF, there are, there are two more capacitors of 12 PF, which finally do come back to ground, right? One way or the other. So to get it back to the frequency, you will either have to uh, reduce the inductance or reduce the capacitance. Now we usually build these with capacitors that we have, which is 220 PF, capac uh, 220 PF capacitors, in which case, what you have to do is you have to tweak the values of each of the inductors individually. And that's easy to do if you're doing a toroid, you just keep taking turns out until you get your pass band in place. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so this is the final shape of the band pass filter. Uh, the, the, the important thing here is it's not terminating on 50 ohms on both sides, right? That's the important thing. On this side, it's going to 1200 ohms. <clears throat> so actually I'll use thousand here. It doesn't matter. These things are pretty for forgiving here. But on this side, I have to terminate it into 50 ohms, which is going to go to the antenna. On the other side, it's going to go into the FET mixer. So how do you do this? You do it exactly like you do it with a transformer, which is you have to have um, a tap. And this is a capacitive tap. So um, 1000 to 50 is a ratio of once to 20 in impedance. The voltage uh, ratio will be a square root of that. So it will be about four, once to four, approximately once to four, once to 4.4. So that's what the ratio of the capacitance is, which is 47 PF to 220 PF. So that's actually, again, pretty simple to do. Each one of them is a fairly simple, you know, just a division or a multiplication, but you just keep applying these iteratively and you get your bandpass filter.
right? So the, this is how you do the bandpass filters. Um, very often, you know, when you're trying to do a radio, you just put coils, capacitors, and keep, you know, fiddling around with these values. At times you get them right, at times you don't get them right. But if you just, you know, follow this simple algorithm, you will always get your bandwidth correctly. The important thing is for you to be able to measure this. And uh, I would highly recommend that you either invest into a nano VNA or Antrino, which we sell. So that's a shameless plug for today. Uh, next slide, please. The one after this. Okay, let me do this. Yeah. Okay, so this here is the simulation of this particular uh, filter. Now, if you just start with some random values and try simulating it, it will never show up anything, you know, which is even beginning to look good. On the other hand, if you start with the values that we, you know, spoke about earlier, and then you put them into either LT Spice or this is a program available again with the EMRFD called GPLA. Uh, it's General Purpose Ladder Analysis, I think. Yeah. And here, what you could do here is, now these are the values, right? So there is a, a load uh, resistance is 50 ohms. There's a 220 PF, uh, you know, parallel capacitor to parallel to 50 ohms. Then the series 47. Then there is a, you know, parallel inductor, then capacitor. So this actually determines or describes the filter here. And this is the shape of the filter. And you can actually tweak these values. So for example, I can say number four, which is the parallel capacitance here, I can change it to something else, click new value, and it will actually give you a new plot here. And if you want to tweak them slightly, even here, you could give, for example, number nine, which is this parallel inductor, and you could, you know, take it up or down by one percent by, you know, hitting on this up and down buttons here. Uh, these are simple tools available, you know, either on LT Spice or on the EMRFD CD, but uh, it's very easy to play with them. You don't even have to fire up your soldering iron or anything, right? I mean, whenever you have time, play with this. You get a very good sense of filters and filters are actually one of the black magic parts of radio design. Uh, highly recommended to play with this. As Wes says, simulation is the great experiment because that's how you have a feel of what happens. It takes a long time for you to wind a new coil, but here you could just change the value, you know, in a second and you know how these things affect each other. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, then the toroids. So um, these are the toroids and I'll pass some around for on both sides. They're not much to look at, but the thing is you couldn't make toroids at home earlier. These toroids are air core. So inside it is all air. And the only way to actually make them easily is to 3D print them. And this is printed on PLA. It takes about 15 minutes on a Prusa printer. Uh, you know, your regular 3D printer to print them out. You know, you can probably pass a couple of them to the back. I have a few more here in case someone wants to, you know, go through with this. You can probably keep passing them off to the back. So again, um, how do you know how much inductance this is going to give? That's actually pre pretty easy to do. Uh, you take a capacitor whose value is known, put this in series with that, okay? And strap it between the input and output of your nano VNA or your Antuino, and you'll get a notch somewhere. And the precise center of that notch will tell you the frequency at which it's re resonating. And you can work back what the inductance was because you know the capacitance, you know the frequency, you can work the inductance. Pretty simple to do. The, there are a lot of good things about these ones. Firstly, they are cheap. Second, they do not saturate. You can even put a kilowatt of power with this. Nothing will happen to it, okay? And if something happens to it, you can you know, make some more. <laughs> uh, next slide, please. Okay, so this is actually our world beating 90 dB dynamic range, 80 dB in channel range radio, the receiver part of it. Okay, we'll come to the transmitter shortly. So um, there are a couple of things which are very, you know, unusual here. First, um, very little of 50 ohms impedance used anywhere here at all. 
Okay, we start with the 50 ohms antenna. Uh, the other side of the bandpass filter is 1K. The output of the mixer here is again 1K, right? Uh, because your filter is also uh, has a characteristic impedance of 1K, directly followed by the detector. There is no IF amplifier, there are no RF amplifiers because both the mixers themselves have gain. And in spite of having gain, in spite of being active mixers, they are very resilient to overloading. They are extremely good mixers. Now, at the other side, you will see that there is a very funny thing happening here. Um, this here, if you see, is an op amp, which is directly coupled to the output of this mixer. There's no capacitor in between. Okay, so essentially, uh, we have critically biased this in such a way that here, there's eight volts here, okay, at the drain of this uh, thing. So now from here, through this op amp, through this entire series of transistors, and I'll tell you what these transistors are, through the second op amp, it's, it, uh, uh, sorry, no, no, just until the volume control, it's one DC line all the way through. So there are no capacitors which are coupling this. Okay, the coupling is entirely DC. <clears throat> and I'm using an op amp here. I mean, you, you remember that a lot of uh, direct conversion receivers or even regular receivers for a long time used a common base audio preamplifier, uh, which was actually probably invented by uh, Roy, uh, W7EL. And we've been following that for a long time. So it's biased with just 0.5 milliampers of current. And it's biased with 0.5 milliampers of current because only at 0.5 milliampers of current, it will exactly give a 50 ohms impedance, which is required for it to be matched with the diode mixer, which is being used as a demodulator. If you don't do that, the diode modulator, you know, does not like it. It starts distorting the you know, IIP3 falls, et cetera, et cetera. Here, we don't have that problem, number one. Number two, uh, it's high impedance output here, which can directly drive the op amp. And these op amps are really superb things. They do not have much of a distortion happening because they're extremely high gain, which is used with this feedback resistor here, right? So the feedback actually controls the linearity of the op amp. Uh, it's done in a very different way. So they do not overload until you have almost one to two volts of uh, audio coming into it. Until then, you're perfectly fine, okay? So um, that's why the dynamic range is very high. But you know, what's happened is that it's very little gain from up here to there. You're just barely managing to keep your head above the noise, uh, above the noise level. So a lot of noise is actually generated right here. And this noise is throughout the audio spectrum, which is why you need to put an active audio filter here. Now, we usually make audio filters using op amps. There's actually no need to do that. You just need a unity gain. That is a gain of one in an amplifier, which is what an emitter follower does. So if you push in a signal into the base, what comes out of the emitter is exactly that signal, right? It's just a unity gain amplifier. Um, and I actually, having used this for a couple of radios, I highly recommend this. Just three transistors, any transistor would do, whether it's 2N2222 or you know, 2N3904, anything, or a BC547. Um, and these resistors here, uh, these 1K resistors here, if you change this to about 3.3K you know, uh, resistors, it becomes a CW filter. It's very easy to change the frequencies by just you know, wearing one. And they're all the same um, uh, values of resistors here. It's actually pretty easy to set this up. But it really changes your entire uh, you know, experience of using the receiver to the extent that, and this is what I did with a lot of people, uh, so, you know, you strap on your headphones and you keep listening to this. So you say, how is it? It's very nice. And then I say, okay, I'm switching it off. So I switch, switch off the audio filter and then he says, no, no, can you just put that back immediately? Because suddenly there is all this noise above three kilohertz, which is streaming into you that you did not know happens on simple radios. Uh, a couple of other, sorry, I keep doing this. A couple of other points here that this oscillator here uh, consumes very little power because you do not have to drive a diode mixer. A diode mixer requires 
5 milliwatts of input. To generate 5 milliwatts of input, the buffer amplifiers have to at least consume about 25 milliampers, uh, you know, 25 milliwatts of power. So uh, here, there is no such requirement at all. And what we've done here is from the bottom here, I've not mentioned it in the circuit, is, uh, is an output to be connected to a frequency counter. So you can actually see the frequency you are at because exactly at five megahertz, the VFO is at two and it, you know, does not move in the opposite direction of what you're tuning. You can just read off the frequency directly from the frequency counter. So it's fairly simple if you see, right? It's, you know, hardly about four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11 transistors and one IC. Okay, yet it's got performance, which is actually better than some of the receivers, you know, uh, far more complex and complicated receivers. It's almost contest grade, except that we have not put AGC into it because <clears throat> I just wanted to keep things very simple. And frankly speaking, I didn't have time. I started building it on this Saturday and I finished it on Sunday, okay? So <laughs> two days, um, well, I'm lying because I've been thinking about this. For example, the cash code mixer, I, you know, I experimented with it almost a year ago. Uh, the, the active uh, filters here from a previous project, but I mean, this is something that I've been thinking about for a long time, but I just managed to put it in here. Uh, now the transmitter, please, uh, the next slide. <clears throat> okay, this is the permeability tunable uh, VFO. So essentially this part is 3D printed. There is a, one nut here and there's another nut sitting inside it here, which hold a quarter 20 bolt onto which you just wind this thing. It's really stable and it's linear. You get 25 kilohertz per turn. Of course, the, the, the tuning shaft keeps coming you know, in and out, but that's actually a feature. If you don't want your friends to be using your radio behind you, you can just remove the tuning knob and take it home. <laughs> so <laughs> so you, know, you just put it in your pocket and say, okay, go on, use this. Uh, this version actually has a latching relay which could change bands, but you know, it's a fairly simple thing to do. Uh, it 3D prints in five minutes. You don't have to go for a variable capacitor or a slow motion drive. And I think this is the easy way of building VFOs now. Very stable as well. And you will see that I've used uh, these polystyrene capacitors. A lot of people go around, you know, trying to search for the, this stuff. Actually, this, is, this stuff is available from Mouser. And uh, these are being used a lot in audio amplifiers, which is why they are also available to us. That apart, if you can handle um, SMD, there are SMD 1206 capacitors available. They are as easy to handle as a quarter watt resistor, really, because if a quarter watt resistor is standing like this, it's about the same width as a 1206 uh, SMD capacitor. In fact, in this, I have soldered legs on, uh, you know, pigtails onto it and use it like a regular, uh, you know, leaded capacitor. In fact, here you might be able to see that. Uh, where is this one? Somewhere here is actually uh, an SMD capacitor which is stack soldered onto um, this for, for coupling, right? I mean, between the gate and the tank circuit, there's a 10 PF, 10 PFs you do not get in polystyrene. So it's an assembly capacitor there. So this is the transmitter. Uh, yeah, this is the transmitter. And there are a couple of surprises here. We've used an NE612 as transmitting mixers. Again, you know, not the conventional wisdom, but it makes a lot of sense to use an NE612 as a modulator and as a, trans, as a transmit mixer. Uh, the reason is this, this is a doubly, doubly balanced uh, mixer, which means that the local oscillator is suppressed to almost minus 50 dB. So without making any, you know, uh, for example, matching your diodes in case of a diode mixer or putting a carrier nulling device, you require none of that. You use an NE612 and there's no carrier. Okay, I'm going to show you the picture of this it just vanishes away. Because that vanishes away, the local oscillator is not there. Even as a transmit mixer, you do not get the local oscillator breakthrough into the pass band, right? 
And because that's not coming through, your IMD is actually comes down, although this overloads very easily. Okay, the OIP, uh, the input um, uh, intercept uh, point of this is just about minus 10 dBm, which is about you know 15 dB less or 25 dB less than that of a diode mixer, right? It doesn't matter. All you're looking here at is that your distortion products should be about 30 dB below your signal. That's all you're looking at, right? So <clears throat> let's be realistic about what you do. On the other hand, it's so simple to do this. There is not a, si I mean, oops, sorry. If you see here, I mean, up till here, it's a complete exciter. Uh, here you do not see a single inductor. Here you do not see a single inductor. This is the modulator. Second, it's so sensitive that you can just directly derive, uh, you know, drive the microphone directly into the NE612. You do not require a mic amplifier at all. Okay. So it's very simple, just two of them and that's it. You do not have to bother about balancing the carrier. You do not have to bo bother about uh, the breakthrough of the local oscillator into the bandpass filter, etc. None of that at all. And very, very clean signal. Okay. So this is how clean it is. <clears throat> and you see here, this is the carrier. And this is almost 40 dB below. And I think this 40 dB below is because it's leaking through somewhere else. It's not because of the NE612. And this is, the, is our um, uh, two-tone test. And two-tone test is actually pretty easy to do. A lot of people think that you have to build a two-tone generator. You don't have to do that. Go to onlinetonegenerator.com. Open it in two windows, 700, on, 700 hertz on one, 1200 hertz on the other, and you're done. Okay, so, uh, and this is about, you know, more than 30 dB down, the IMD, if you see here, it's pretty well done, you know. It's really impressive for two chips, okay, 612s, which cost about a dollar each. I'll just go back here. So that's the thing. The only problem with, you know, this entire circuit is what you're getting out here is about minus 20 dBm, that is about 50 millivolts. That's all, right? You require this to go up to let's say five watt level. So first thing that you do is amplify it up and the signal is low enough that you can use an RC coupled um, termination insensitive amplifier, which is what this is, followed by a two stage um, driver to the IRF 510. Um, this is discovered by uh, Alison that she's recommended using two and two 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 A's in place of 2N3904 as your drivers. They have much better current. They have got much better distortion capabilities. They cost just about the same. So uh, that's what is done here. And uh, there's one more small detail that you have to put a 220PF capacitor right between the source and drain of the IRF510. This is to prevent a lot of VHF uh, parasitics from coming through. Uh, but you know, apart from that, it's a fairly simple design. Uh, now, if you see this, the, that's a complete transceiver. Okay, this is a complete transceiver. And uh, in this transceiver, there's one very weird thing that you will see. There are no transformers except in the power amplifier circuitry. Okay, neither the mixer nor the modulators, nowhere except in the transmitter here. Okay, and here I have used two transistors by filler. Uh, transformers, even those can be eliminated very easily. Okay, I just didn't have the time to do this. Uh, you can use an L match there because it's a narrow band circuit to do with this. <clears throat> a lot of people have problems, you know, winding this bi filler and tri filler coils. You don't have to do it. Okay, and if you look at this design, this actually reminds you of the stuff that we saw in 1970s QSTs, etc. Except that they did not apply enough maths to it. They just sort of build it. I know if it works move on with this. But if you apply a little more of maths, which is available, you know, tools like LT spice available, using the same circuitry and optimizing it a little more, you get, you can still get a lot of, you know, uh, performance from really, you know, old architectures. This is last century, right? This is 1970s. This is, you know, almost 50 years ago. So uh, that's the thing, uh, I'll have the circuit up on vu2esc.com very soon.
and this is what it looks from like inside. Uh, there is a very, okay, there's a feature that I need to tell you about, which is the frequency counter. It's one of these Chinese things I bought off the eBay. I plugged it in and when I switched it on, it's generated a huge squeal. Okay, a really bad noise. So what I did is I converted that into a feature. So there's a button here. If you press this button, the frequency lights up, then you leave it. So it's like the frequency markers of the 1970s. You get on the frequency and then you leave it out. <laughs> okay. You also save on the current, by the way, you know. So the thing is, it's, an, it's a radio which consumes only 24 milliamps of current. Okay. There are very few radios which will work with such a low power. So one, you know, uh, pack of dry cells will last you weeks. If you're like me, 99% of the time, I'm just listening to others. Um, you know, for me, it's either while working, it's either blues or it's seven megahertz band noise. So, you know, just, just put it on, get onto your favorite frequency. Somebody might come in or go out. It's actually, you know, like sitting in Starbucks with friends coming in and out. So, <clears throat> Um, now you'll see a couple of other things here. One is um, the bandpass filter needs to be shielded. It's not yet shielded. If you shield that, by the way, your image rejection can go down to 90 dB. And this is very surprising. Okay. I mean, don't quote me. I don't know the recording. Elecraft uses only double tuned circuits. I don't know why they do not use triple tuned circuits in the front end. Um, that's probably because HF broadcasters have all vanished. Even radio peaking is now, you know, not active. So, um, but nevertheless, okay, just putting those shields. And if you look at the shielding, it's made out of this really thin copper sheets that you get in the market. I, I think they're used in transformers. I'm not sure what they use it for, but you, I mean, in, in India, you get this from the copper shops. Uh, I've built um, a casing for the VFO also with that. The VFO casing is required for two purposes. One, of course, is that you isolate it thermally so that the heat coming in from the PA does not get in there. Second thing is it's shielded electrically from the bandpass filter, which is right behind it. Okay. And the power amplifier has also got a shield running across it. Uh, the radios here, you can, you know, come and open it and look at it. So um, it's actually... Uh, you know, build in quotes the ugly way, uh, the uglier the better. Uh, you know, I mean, you get brownie points these days, by the way, for this. Um, you'll see a lot of shoulder blobs here and there, which are there because you know if you're trying different configurations. But uh, it's a radio that I used for actually two two mornings, and it's actually pretty good. The stability is so good that I can actually decode FT8. Okay, it's that good. The stability is that good uh, that you could do that. There's no speaker to it. And I kept the speaker away because the moment you put something like an LM386 or an LM380 or whatever, the distortion really goes up. Okay. And um, when we finished it, I had a couple of colleagues who work with me at, my, uh, at HF Signals who are also radio hams. And I said, you know, just try this out. And they were completely blown away because they said that we can hear signals which you couldn't hear before. You know, you just plug the headphones on and you can do that. <clears throat> so uh, this is actually something which, you know, Hans point, pointed out to me that he does not use LM386s, et cetera, in his radios. He just uses op amps and they actually give very good audio. And I thought that that's because he was using direct conversion. It's not about direct conversion. It's actually problem with the crossover distortions of these power amplifier chips, audio power amplifier chips. Probably the class D amplifiers don't have that problem, but the easiest thing to do is drop in an any 5532 in your audio amplifier. Okay. Next. All right. So first, thanks to David for encouraging me to take on this project. Um, that's actually very kind of him to, you know, allow us to do something retro, which is to build radios. Uh, Wes, you know, I really can't thank him enough for the sort of tools he has built, the, te you know, the techniques which we all use today. Uh, then RK, actually via to HR, he did all the 3D prints. In fact, he designed the toroids. I called him up over the phone. I explained to him 
and in half an hour's time he had sent the file down. I mean, just imagine this, you are able to download toroids. I never thought in my life I could download a toroid. So the toroid came in, you know, plugged it into my 3D printer and you know, it was like taking an inkjet printout. And Anil and uh, VU2 BVB are responsible for really the horrible job of making this. Um, Chassis, uh, they actually put the entire thing together, but thankfully overnight they managed to get it going. I'll upload the details on VU2 ESC by the weekend. So, you know, that's about the video. Uh, you know, any questions? Or... Thank you so much. Uh, the, the FETs you mean? Yeah. Yeah, they're very easy to get. Actually, at uh, a dance small parts, you'd get, I mean, I, I bought 10 of them for $2. Okay. Uh, they're still in production. They're available on Mouser. Mouser yesterday had 5,000 of them available. The SMD parts are even cheaper. So that's less than 10 cents per transistors. Hold them up, you know, before they go out of stock. The J310s are really good transistors. Thank you.